Ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, students, alumni, welcome. Ahlan wa sahlan bikum fi Georgetown. Welcome to Georgetown, which is your home as well as our home. Um, Georgetown University in Qatar, the School of Foreign Service in Qatar, is a peculiar institution, a wonderful institution of which I have the honor to be the, the current dean. Um, we, I have the, the, the pleasure, we have the pleasure to have with us in our company the founding dean of this institution 10 years ago, Dr. James Redden Anderson, um, who will be with us for the conference. The reason we're organizing this conference is because it's part of the celebrations of our 10-year presence here in Doha. 10 years ago, this whole institution to bring the Bachelor of Foreign Service, the School of Foreign Service to Qatar, seemed a very unlikely idea to many, but it's proven an incredible success. Um, I, I would say that, of course, as the dean of this institution, but I think we have hard evidence to show it. Um, if you see where we started with seven faculty, one single major, and where we're now, about 50 odd faculty of world class, globally competitive research, four majors, three certificates, or as other un universities might call it, minors, including a very innovative one that's only possible in this environment of Education City. A minor in media and politics we're, do we're doing jointly with Northwestern University. So I think the concept of School of Foreign Service in Qatar, the concept of Education City has proven itself. If you look at our alumni, at, by the end of this year, we'll be up to 270 alumni. They're all over the place. They're, they're literally, in, in a positive sense, they're, they're working in the se any sectors from, from sports to law to energy to, indeed, diplomacy. Um, so it's a very, very broad spectrum, and they're functioning at the highest level. And that, is, that links me to um, the reason why we're organizing a conference like this. The Bachelor of Foreign Service and the School of Foreign Service's work is not just about diplomacy, as many people assume. It's really a wonderful example of a liberal arts education that's globally focused. And because of that, the kinds of the curriculum that we teach and the kind of faculty that we bring are very broad spectrum. They're multidisciplinary. It's a multidisciplinary uh, cohort of, of faculty. Anything from philosophy to history to economics to politics and international affairs and, and so on. So our students go through all of these disciplines, knit them together, and so do our faculty. So the idea was that the research of this excellent um, faculty that we have here present in Doha, to showcase this research, to, to bring them all together, to have them talk across these disciplinary interconnections or um, um, interfaces and to bring them together with the best from around the world around this core subject of power. We thought that that was the ultimate way of celebrating our 10 years in Doha. It's all very well to have gala events and flashy sort of celebrations. It's far more important to do it through substance. That really typifies what Georgetown in Qatar is about. So on that note, I'm going to shut up. I'm, I'm going to hand you over to the real, the really important people who've been driving this conference and the people you're going to be listening to for the next two days. So let me introduce, for starters, one of these wonderful faculty of ours, Professor Firat Boruch, Professor of World Literatures. Firat. Dear esteemed guests, colleagues, and students, it's a great honor to introduce uh, Professor Laura Doyle, our distinguished keynote speaker for the 10th anniversary conference at Georgetown, Qatar. Dr. Doyle is a professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and co-director of the World Studies Interdisciplinary Project which brings together social scientists and humanity, uh, humanists to foster scholarship informed by new directions in non-Eurocentric world history 
and transnational studies. In her long and distinguished career, Professor Doyle has lectured widely in numerous institutions in the United States and abroad, including England, Ireland, and Germany. And we are very happy to have her with us here in Doha. Professor Doyle's excellence in research and teaching has been recognized with prestigious awards and fellowships, including honorary award for outstanding research accomplishments, the Leverhulme Research Professorships, uh, Professorship at the University of Exeter, two American Council of Learned Societies fellowships, and a Rockefeller Fellowship in Intercultural Scholarship at Princeton University. In her interdisciplinary approach to culture and politics, Professor Doyle has focused especially on racial and inter-imperial formations of modernity, adopting Fernard Brodel's method of long durée and world systems analysis to cultural and literary history. Her book publications examine in particular the racial matrix of modern fiction and culture in Atlantic modernity, new forms of political agency and resistance, and a philosophical approach to transnational studies informed by 20th century pioneering dialectical theorists such as Maurice Morleau-Ponty, Franz Fanon, and Louis Althusser. In her lecture today, Professor Doyle will offer us from her current work on inter-imperiality, economy, and the dialectics of culture, which proposes a groundbreaking paradigm for combining recent world historiography and post-colonial studies to reframe current dis discussions of politics, globalization, and empire. The theoretical framework of inter-imperiality, states Professor Doyle, names a political and historical set of conditions created by the violent histories of plural interacting empires and by interacting persons moving between and against empires. On behalf of the conference organizing committee and Georgetown School of Foreign Service in Qatar, I would like to thank Professor Doyle for being with us today. Please join me in welcoming her to the podium. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I, it's my first time in Doha, and it's an experience to see the city and what you are all building here. So um, I'm, I'm inspired by the possibilities. I want to thank um, Farad, Professor Oruj, wherever you went, um, and thank you for that lovely introduction, and also I think for being key in my being here. Um, also, uh, Professor Purbai, who was uh, my liaison and very helpful along the way, and the entire committee and everyone who did the work to make the conference possible, thank you for having me. I'm looking very forward to the conversation. Um, interdisciplinarity makes me very happy. So, um, uh, I'm, yeah, I think it will be very interesting. Let's see. So, um, I'm also doing a PowerPoint, which is not what I typically do, so let's hope this goes smoothly. That's the title. Um, there'll be a few slides in the beginning, maybe five early in the talk, and then it'll go quiet for a while and a few at the end. In the frame story of A Thousand and One Nights, Shahrazad tells tales to her husband, the Sasanid Persian emperor, in order to defer his plan to execute her the morning after their wedding. Shahrazad has offered herself in marriage to him and begun her tale telling as a strategy to stop the violence of state execution that he has practiced against all of his newly wed wives. <laughs> 
since he believes that women cannot be trusted to remain faithful beyond one night. I take Shahrazad's strategy of storytelling deferral as one element of the shrewd temporal structuring of A Thousand and One Nights and a hint of its commentary on scapes of power. A second hint lies in her practice of embedding tales within tales in which a series of traveling narrators take stage to tell their stories. The structure often leaves listeners uncertain about which time frame we occupy, and as each tale ends, we are pulled disconcertingly out of a past time and other place into the present time and the place of telling. Yet most striking of all is the discrepancy in the relation between the tale-telling frame and the historical content of the tales told, as recorded in the authoritative manuscripts of these originally oral tales. For there is a quiet anachronism in this frame-to-story relation. The opening of the frame places us explicitly in the Sassanid Empire, a pre-Islamic empire that, in historical fact, as many of you know, uh, ruled territories from the Mediterranean to Central Asia in the third to the seventh centuries of the Christian calendar. And um, uh, please excuse me, I will simply refer to the Christian calendar in this talk today for s matters of simplification, but I will note that it's a uh, one of a many in important indicators of the relation between time and our ways of keeping time and politics, as well as religion, of course. Shahrazad's husband, loosely figures one of the late Sassanid emperors. Yet many of the tales that Shahrazad tells take place in the later Abbasid Islamic empire. For instance, those tales featuring the 8th century caliph Harun al-Rashid. Not only is this impossible historically, of course, but, and here's the key political clue, the Persian Sassanid empire no longer existed in the 8th century exactly because it had been invaded and conquered in the 7th by the expanding Islamic empire um, of the, Abba, of the um, Umayyads um, that Harun al-Rashid and the Abbasids eventually uh, took over, I'll just say. I suggest that this discrepancy is no mere residual error in the structure of the tales, nor is Shahrazad a historical soothsayer. Rather, the anachronism encodes a different model of history, a different relation among empires than the successionist one famously expressed in the principle of imperia translatio. That is, the standard idea that one great empire succeeds another on the world stage in a sort of torch-passing narrative of global history, and which in some Eurocentric progress story versions moves from east to west across the globe in the march of manifest destiny. The structure of 1001 Nights asks, asks us to think outside this linear model of geopolitical history and instead to see the overlapping and sedimented scapes of power. For in the ears of listeners, the effect of the temporal discrepancy is to collapse empires and historical periods into one another. This literary structuring dramatizes a certain simultaneity of empires. When we recall that many members of the Abbasid court descended originally from Persian Sassanid families who had assimilated after the conquering, including some vizier families like Shahrazad's, we glimpse some of the political palimpsest signaled by this simultaneity. In this way, the framing structure positions the highly educated Persian woman Shahrazad between empires. She straddles political states and times, bridging political temporalities. It is from that position that she quietly embodies a dissenting existential political situation, one that many communities, generations, and historical actors have shared with her, the situation of living dangerously among and between multiple empires. And she shows that this condition can determine even our most intimate relations. This tale of two empires shaping Shahrazad's situation implicitly beckons us to consider the full range of empires shaping our situations, to consider multiple empires within and across periods, including empires south, north, west, and east, before, during, and after European hegemony. It suggests that in analyses of power in so-called modernity, 
especially a post-colonial or critical geopolitical analysis, we would ideally take account not only of British, French, Spanish, and US empires, but also of Russian, Chinese, Ottoman, Brazilian, Japanese, and Ethiopian empires. And following Shahrazad's temporal logic, we'd think not only about these, but also about those that shaped the conditions of their emergence, such as the Mughal, the Incan, the Mamluk, and the Safavid. Today I'll describe a concept of interimperiality that I've recently been developing um, to analyze these cumulative, volatile, world-shaping dynamics and positions among and between empires. So as Firat was saying, this is part of a, of a book project that hopefully will be finished in the coming year. Um, there are discussions that I'm drawing from in publication um, in various journals, the most recent in the journal Globalizations, a special issue on world politics and dialectics that I recommend overall. Focusing on a field of multiple empires interacting in any one period, this inter-imperial analysis studies empires in three dimensions. The interactions among imperial and con empires and their economies, the interpositional maneuvering and situations of those persons, communities, smaller states that exist often precariously in the field of empires and sometimes act against them, that's two. And finally, the cumulative layers of empire across centuries, in which, a, for instance, a conquered or past empire is felt as a sedimented presence within another. So, okay. First hitch. Um, just need to get to where I can see the arrows. Oh, that worked. Um, so. Lateral, vectored, and temporal is just one way to remember what, what I'm trying to capture under this term interimperial, where the inter has several, uh, several meanings, works in several dimensions. So with this attention to a sort of uh, 360 degree, you might say, um, attention to empires, I'm aiming to offer a longer uh, optic on the scapes of power, including both state and non-state actors. I'll suggest that the model also enables more trenchant accounts of what we call globalization and modernization. My, emphas my emphasis on interaction signals the dialectical aspect of this model. So I'm just gonna say a little bit about that. Here it's necessary to say first that despite familiar simplifications that cast a dialectical relation as an oppositional one between forces of self and other or thesis and antithesis, the long tradition of dialectical analysis has often described more multi-sided, complex relations, from early Chine Chinese Taoist philosophers to pre-Socratic Mediterranean philosophers to Hegel and Marx. In all of these thinkers, dialectics, above all names, a manifold, interconnected field of mutually transformative engagements among beings and things of all kinds if you look at these philosophers, they're thinking about the physical universe with humans in it. These relations are structured and structuring, and in the case of humans, involve economic, political, and cultural institutions. Whew, that's beautiful. So just because that was a lot of words um, with a lot of syllables, manifold interconnected field, engagements that transform everyone involved in the field, um, and which for humans, economic, political, and cultural. Um, and just, um, I'll, I'll flesh that out a little bit here. So the engagements typically entail adaptation um, by all parties, whether willing or unwilling. Um, so that if, uh, for instance, some of you are familiar with Mary Louise Pratt's idea of transculturation in the, in the contact zone, that would be a, a version of this. Um, and um, as each actor or entity adjusts to the force or presence of the others, all parties undergo transformation. These co-forming relations can be driven by coercion or by care. It can be the relation between a parent and a child. Um, yet in any case, they are difficult because they entail engagement across difference. Different needs, different positions, different personal and collective histories, and of course, across, across different cultures, genders, classes, and beliefs. Here, what I'm calling inter-imperial dialectics, 
uh, aims to connect the macro level field of geopolitics and the micro level of daily life and jockeying empires. And this is where the influence of existential uh, philosophy, existential dialectical philosophy comes into my thinking. That's just to summarize that. Um, combining the macro level and the micro level state and non-state, tracking the everyday as it unfolds within a larger field of empires and develops over the longer durée. So within this model, the theory teases out three dialectical processes, co-formation, co-production, and accretion. And so the lecture today will mostly try to flesh these out. So the, the co-formation of states, economies, and cultures over, I'm going to focus on mainly sort of the last two millennia, state and non-state actors. The trans-hemispheric co-production, and I'll get into the details of this, of technological infrastructures and cultural institutions within the inter-imperial inter field. And this creates both homogenization across the globe and destabilization in ways I'll try to explain. And finally, over time, the temporal dimension, an accretion of these infrastructures and in turn of what I'm going to call geopolitical or inter-imperial unconscious that is embedded in our psychic lives and reinforced in combined and unevenly developed environments. I do want to say that, of course, many kinds of state participate in these processes. The inter-imperial model tracks the ways that empires and their inhabitants have particularly shaped them within the expansionist, interventionist, wealth amassing efforts of empires. It just, uh, I won't go into all the reasons why, but um, it's a, partly to move us outside, have us look beyond the international model where the, the focus on those relations starts with the supposed nation state in the 15th, 16th century. Um, it seems to me that when we focus out and see multiple empires in any one period, as well as developing over successive periods, that be provides a backstory for the emergence of nation states understood in the Westphalian model. So I'll hint at that later. So that's just one reason to think about inter-imperial. The model draws on insights from theorists of internal and external dynamics of state formation, such as Charles Tilley, Theta Scotchpole, and Stephen Walt, and many others. It also takes fuller account, while being influenced by their work, of the imperial contours of these state-shaping processes. And it positions the rise of European states in relation to states of Afro-Eurasia from the medieval to the modern periods. In this way, I'm aiming to correct accounts of, of Eurocentric accounts of state formation, including that Westphalian narrative, while also extending the post-colonial critique of power. In what follows, I'll focus first on the co-formation of sophisticated Afro-Asian states and economies before the rise of Europe. I'll then turn to the dialectical co-production of infrastructures among these networked states, including cultural institutions and media instruments. Last, I'll consider the inter-imperial maneuvering among dissenters in the history of geopolitical power before concluding with brief remarks on some implications for contemporary escapes of power. So this will be a kind of thick stew. <laughs> this is not a, a light meal that I'm about to offer. Um, so. Although A Thousand and One Nights has been one inspiration for the concept of inter-imperiality, the primary catalyst has been the powerful new scholarship in non-Eurocentric history. In the last 30 years, at least, scholars have garnered rich material, gathered rich material on pre-1500 states and system formation across hemispheres that transforms conventional narratives of modernization, state building, cultural institutions, and capitalism. Building on pioneering work by social scientists such as Hodgson, McNeil, Abu Lagod, and cultural historians, Locke, Matlitsky, Menachol, and McDeasy, for instance, recent studies have tracked the early interactive emergence, as John Wills calls it, of sophisticated states and technologies in Afro-Eurasia. Much of this scholarship reassesses the so-called great divergence of European modernity casting European projects not as a radical origin of new systems, but rather as an outgrowth of existing systems and earlier convergences and divergences. The data reveals that many systems we call modern were consolidated in a period that Westerners call medieval, not in the West, 
but in the global South and East among Asian, Islamic, and African states, and to some extent as well in the pre-Columbian empires of the Americas. Scholars have tracked these modernizing formations as they spread across the hemispheres of Afro-Eurasia and arrived at the doorstep of Western Europeans in the later medieval period who entered this system and eagerly emulated its sophisticated state and economic practices. The modern elements of these states included, for instance, exchange of ideas in public forums and public libraries, massive infrastructure building projects such as ports, roads, and carefully planned cities, the import of commodities into these well-planned metropoles for urban and wage-earning populations, systems for finance and capital and labor regimes, economic structures of core and periphery, imperial knowledge building projects serving colonization and state building, and cultural appropriation and interpolation of conquered communities through art forms and media. Sound familiar? <laughs> um, what changes when we truly integrate these facts into our models? And again, some of you know this, on our world historians, and, and um, it's, there's a world out there that uh, one of my goals in this project is simply to uh, summarize a lot of that and carry it over into some of the disciplines that aren't yet taking on this uh, material. And there are complicated reasons, I think, why people haven't, haven't taken it on, because it's been there for a little while, it has to do with empire, but we can talk about that later. In attempting to offer an answer to the question about what this changes in our models, I'll begin with the relation between state and economy, partly because of its privileging in standard thinking about modern state formation. The, anal the analysis I'll present here instead highlights the mutual unfolding or co-formation of state and economy over the last 2,000 years. Excuse me. Contrary to reigning assumptions, the recent evidence reveals that quote unquote, rational forms of capital accruing systemic collaborations among states and merchants were central to pre-1500 political economies. Some scholars detect such relations in ancient periods, but certainly in the so-called medieval period in Afro-Eurasia, as Abu Lagod and others have shown, states and merchants worked in concert, as well as in fierce competition, to build the systems of transport, finance, and literate education we call modern. Abu Lagod concludes that key state capitalist linkages were consolidated between approximately 1000 and 1400 CE, and she shows that the Abbasid Islamic Empire in particular put in place the, quote, legal and institutional prerequisites for financing and administering capitalist production and exchange, end quote, including banks, lending contracts, and port rules. Several Chinese dynasties likewise encouraged trade and benefited from close ties with merchant families in their expansionist efforts, including the dynasties of the Sung, the Mongol, and the Qing, although others, of course, cur actively curtailed merchant power and influence, such as the Ming. Historian Amira Benison also reminds us that merchants sometimes manage their state relationships effectively enough to radically reshape a state as in the case of the Bar Barmakid family. For after the Islamic Umayyads conquered the Neo-Persian Sasanid Empire in the seventh century, the Persian Barmakid merchant family assimilated and converted to Islam. They then eventually aligned themselves with the Abbasids to overthrow the Umayyads, issuing in what Solomon Goitin has called a quote-unquote bourgeois revolution that served the interests of both the merchants and the new expanding Abbasid Empire. A range of other scholarship confirms the picture of interlocking relations between merchants and states across medieval, that's always in quotes in my mind, Afro-Eurasia. Archival documents establish that merchants worked within regulatory codes, including about place of habitation and trade within the port city, length of stay, unloading procedures, bills of sale or lending, and taxes for the imperial host. As Philippe Beaujard explains, Merchants, have merchants may have tolerated such regulations, quote, because they required a stable world to develop their operations and or a military force to defend their access to vital resources, and so could hardly do without the state, end quote. 
The merchants undoubtedly also profited at times since they, quote, furnished merchandise as well as services to elites, end quote, for instance, in the form of tax collection. In turn, states very likely supplemented and calibrated their relations with each other through such traveling agents who often lived together in designated port neighborhoods. Thus, we might amend Ferdinand Brodal's claim that trade in the medieval Mediterranean, quote, ignored the frontiers of empires, unquote, and consider instead the ways in which trade was as much inter-imperial as extra-imperial, often fostered with an eye to capital accruing, empire building projects. This brings us to the second element of inter-imperial co-production. For indeed, state merchant relations within the Afro-Eurasian inter-imperial field seemed to have driven inf investment in infrastructure building of all kinds. These would include those interconnecting material structures of roads and ports, as well as systems of agricultural production that eventually reached across Asia and Africa to the Americas. As Hugh Kennedy, Maya Schatzmiller, and others have discussed, in large powerful states, taxes and tribute were put to careful use not only in palace building, but also in shipbuilding, city building, and other projects. In pursuing these, individual empires also imitated, borrowed, stole, and extended each other's inventions and systems. These kinds of exchanges have been considered in recent scholarship, such as the essay collection, Imperial Formations, which uh, Ann Stoller and others have co-edited, and in Jane Burbank and Fred Cooper's important book, Empires in World History, 2010, I think. But there's still more theorizing and re-narrating to do, I believe. For instance, we might reconsider in dialectical terms the history of capitalism's rise in relation to these state infrastructural projects. Historian Edmund Burke III has specified nine what he calls technological complexes consolida consolidated by Islamic empire in the 8th through 14th centuries and the, the various, um, including as it sort of broke into different caliphates. Including, for instance, among the nine, a writing information complex, these are his terms, a water management complex, and a mathematical cosmological complex the adoption of which expanded as, as Islamic states extended their territory. I would draw attention to the intersecting layered history through which these complexes were produced. The Abbasid Empire built its water management systems by resuscitating and extending the quote from Burke, major macro level hydraulic projects, end quote, developed in ancient Mesopotamian empires, for instance, including five transverse canals serving to divert and connect rivers across that terrain. And likewise, after conquering the Persian Sassanids, the Abbasids have benefited from, benefited from the ancient Persian filtration and Qanat system, Q-A-N-A-T, an underground gravity flow tunnel used for irrigation of arid lands. This system, the Qanat system, was originally installed across 1,000 miles of the Iranian plateau from Iraq to Afghanistan, and then had been an, and was upgraded by the Sassanid Empire in the centuries before Islam's defeat of it. As some of you undoubtedly know, eventually such waterway systems built earlier guided the building of the Suez Canal, beginning when Napoleon's engineers intentionally sought to discover the ancient paths followed by the engineers of Persian King Darius in the 6th century BC. The Suez, the Suez Crisis, by the way, quick aside, as it unfolded under Nasser, reminds us of the inter-imperial maneuvering provoked by such projects, as also signaled in the other name for this geopolitical conflict, the tripartite aggression. But first, we must stay a bit longer with the historical backstory for it has implications for any narrative of power, capitalism, and state building. In the later medieval period, elements of these hydraulic packages were borrowed in Venice and in the Low Countries, including in Dutch dikes and Rhineland dams, thereby powering the important medieval Flemish markets and textile trade that scholars have considered central to the rise of capitalism in Western Europe. At the same time, Knowledge of the Kanat system arrived in Al-Andalusian Spain 
via, via the Umayyads, who relocated there after the Abbasid overthrow. This technological knowledge was then carried by the Spanish to the Americas, where it helped to create more sustainable agriculture for those colonizing states, with help from engineering clues and infrastructures of the Incan and Aztec empires. In the long run, this inter-imperial transfer of technologies, like the silver mining practices of Europeans that built on pre-Columbian American empires, gave Portugal and Spain the leverage to challenge Afro-Eurasian states to their east, um, in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. So, so the, the, the technologies have moved this way. They, there's been interaction, imitation, retooling, and those states then gather their own power. And these are the kinds of dialectical returns of appropriated elements that I'm trying to track. In this light, historian David Christian notes that what we call Western modernity is, quote, the product of an economic and technological synergy that was generated over several millenniums in different parts of the world, end quote. As recent scholars of South American empires have pointed out, we should also include pre-Columbian America in this synergy. Yet politically, the important implication of this history is not simply what David Christian calls the underlying unity of Afro-Eurasian history. Seen through a dialectical and inter-imperial lens, this history provides a longer trans-hemispheric perspective on the political economy of capital accretion. As I'm highlighting, this capital accumulation encompasses the long historical co-production of technologies and engineered infrastructures. And the history suggests that dialectical processes of contest, co-adaptation, co and homogenization have driven capitalist globalization over at least a millennium or more. In this process, even as states and especially empires have opposed or sabotaged each other, they have increasingly adopted or adjusted to each other's systems, creating mutually serving, if contested, infrastructures. This mutual sublimated appropriation of elements is what Hegel called sublation in his account of dialectics. Yet at the same time, while this accretion of capital and systems has driven globalizing modernization, it has also intensified conflict and instability in several ways. First, these systems gradually establish a geography of unequal distribution of and access to modern systems and infrastructures, plumbing, electricity, streets. Persisting over centuries, these durable infrastructures perform what Michael Mann called track laying work, systemically inhibiting access to modernization for some communities while enabling it for others. That is, they can reinforce the process of what theorists have called uneven and combined development. In turn, because, because entrenched inequality generates suffering, it also causes division, distrust, dissent, and unrest. At the same time, exactly because networked and material knowledge systems have statist and capitalist ambitions, oops, have made statist and capitalist ambitions for globalization more viable, these systems have spawned more frequent territorial conflict and sharper financial competition. As systems allow interventionist states to penetrate territories more deeply and exert more invasive control, more kinds of actors engage at the local level in these conflicts. Finally, amid these conflicts, dissenters, dissenters emerge, and dissenters have themselves become inter-imperial maneuverers, now in the second sense of inter, operating in between and against empires. For as technologies have spread, so too has collective anti-colonial action become more viable, especially as uncredentialed political actors, uncredentialed political actors maneuver among empires to seize hold of the technologies and institutions. Such actors also sometimes gain power by providing the infrastructural services, as we know, that were once the province of states, just indicating the importance of infrastructures in this geopolitics. So I'm going to return a little bit later to this strategic collective dissent um, near the end of the lecture. <clears throat> 
Yet to see the full inscape of this volatile, dialectically generated field, we must add in the final element of cultural institutions, which have long mediated these processes. To capture this long legacy, it makes sense to begin with the first easily reproduced media technology, paper. The paper making and printing technologies first developed in China between the first and seventh centuries not only led to the first paper money, they also allowed the growth of China's literacy-centered state building and its imperial expansion, helping to affect its self-representation and projection over increasingly vast territories, as Mark Edward Lewis analyzes in Writing and Authority in Early China. At the same time, paper supported the launching of a large-scale civil service corps with state examinations, all of which enabled ever wider interpolation of populations and the powerfully imagined community of this expanding empire. As we'll see, access or lack of access to these interpolating instruments has further shaped the dialectical processes of dissent and state formation. But to continue the story a little longer, given its state building power, the capacity to manufacture paper provoked the interest of other states and became a sought after technology, not unlike nuclear power today. The first rival to emulate it was the Abbasid state, which as it expanded eastward in the 8th century, collided with the westward expanding Tang, Chinese Tang dynasty. Islam too eventually became a culture of the book, extending its hegemony further east and south across Afro-Eurasia. By the time Europeans engaged at length with imperial courts, Islamic imperial courts in Spain and Africa, as when crusading princes were hosted there or held um, between battles, these states had developed scholarly institutions as powerful organs of state. Their accomplishments drew northern European scholars south to libraries in parts of Spain and Africa, helping to catalyze the turn toward what's called European scholasticism. All of this is well established. For instance, scholars have documented in the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries when the largest libraries in Christendom held a couple of a thousand volumes, one, maybe two at most. Islamic libraries in Africa and in the Middle East contain tens or hundreds of thousands of volumes, such as that of the vizier of the African Fatimid Caliphate Al-Amin in Cairo, which numbered half a million. Many of these books were scientific, which of course informed the state's technological and engineering projects. It should be no surprise, therefore, if in these centuries Europeans suffered from and were motivated by what Gerald MacLean calls imperial envy. Furthermore, like the engineered infrastructures, these intellectual and cultural infrastructures were co-constituted by vying states, that is formed through inter-imperial competition and conquering. As Jonathan Bloom establishes, empires deliberately borrowed or stole from their neighbors and rivals library collections, seeking for strategic reasons to understand their science, literature, philosophy, religion, and arts. To allied empires, they sent delegations of scholars who brought and hoped for manuscripts as gifts. And to enemy empires, they sent officers with orders to capture manuscript collections as valuable booty, as in wars between the Byzantine and Abbasid empires. Scholars, too, were booty, kidnapped or forced to serve new masters, creolizing knowledge, while also maneuvering in ways that, I'd venture to guess, have implicitly shaped scholarly codes and legacies ever since. Necessarily, translation projects stood at the center of these empire-building activities and of competition over knowledge, both for infrastructure building and for influence in contested territories. As Bloom points out, quote, the translation of Persian, Greek, and Indian works into Arabic became a regular state activity and this was true in many states. Just as the ambitious state-supported translation of Indian Buddhist manuscripts taken from India had helped Chinese dynasties to consolidate power in Central Asia and later to interpolate millions into what became the state religion of Buddhism. Likewise, in seventh century Japan, translation of Chinese and Buddhist manuscripts served to build an island-wide hegemony for Japanese rulers, according to Joan Piggott. In all cases, the translators thus participated, voluntarily or involuntarily, in the dialectical globalizing processes of co-adaptation, 
co-production and homogenization. One last point on this. The cultivation of mathematical knowledge most clearly epitomizes the early importance of translation and intellectual institutions to political economy. The decimal system for mathematical computation arrived with the publication of al khwarizmis ninth century book, Calculation of the Hindu Numerals, which elaborated on the Hindu Arabic numerical system to describe computational methods using zero and the notion of place value. His work depended on the interim period generated availability of paper, and it reflected the interim period history of state formation, for al khwarizmi was an Abbasid scholar of Persian descent. In turn, when his book was translated into Hebrew and Latin in the later medieval period, this new computational practice became a trans-hemispheric accounting system. In Burke's words, these events helped to create, quote, a single market from Spain and Africa to India and China with a single language of administration, Arabic, and a single monetary system, end quote, thus facilitating the integration of European markets and eventually American markets into an increasingly global world system. In this way, translated knowledge has homogenized and intensified interimperial systems, creating what we might call a legacy of lingua techna. So this long dialectical analysis aims to offer a more multidimensional account of power's lateral, vectored, and cumulative dynamics. And it allows us to place later developments back within the fully global world from which they emerged. For instance, it should now be clear that the world in which so-called modern Westphalian European states first took shape was already a trans-hemispherically connected, intentionally networked one. I'm not going to go into this today um, and talk about that. I do write about that in the Globalizations article. Um, but I'll just point toward um, the period. Let's see. Oops. Skip that one. OK. Um, th of the Protestant Revolution and the Westphalian settlement, because they, they've provided so often a pair of origin points for narratives of modernity and state formation. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into this, but I'll just highlight that um, the, 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 the Protestant, starting with Martin Luther, who is a very shrewd inter-imperial inter manipulator, he, he was no fan of Islam. It's not as if he was allying with Islam against um, the Christian ha Habsburg Empire, but he, he threatened, for instance, to uh, you know, not um, support the call to military support um, against the Ottomans. Um, later Protestants, the Dutch and the English in particular, actually built strong alliances with the Ottoman Empire um, in their, as they broke away from um, the Catholic Church. So then there's the literacy and print practices. I think of that now with this longer history in mind. Um, wouldn't have happened without that longer history. Um, and there's quite a bit of literature now on the ways that Europe was learning liberal laws and thought, et cetera, religious tolerance, we know some of this, um, in ways that later that history got forgotten and was called European liberal thought. Um, so that's the rough picture there. Um, so um, let's see. Yet instead of dwelling here, I'd like to return finally to the dynamics of more recent periods and more specifically anti-colonial dissent within the inter-imperial field. This too is a multi-sided affair. Let's see, I think I'll wait to do that slide. One key element in these dynamics is the relation between dissidents within one empire and rival states seeking to weaken that empire for their own purposes. That is, on the one hand, empires have regularly cultivated alliances with dissident communities and ethnic or religious minorities in rival empires. They've often done so under the pretense of protecting or liberating these communities, and sometimes the protection has been real. Um, yet frequently, the larger goal has been to destabilize rival empires, as John Ledun shows is the case for Russian imperial policy in the 18th and 19th centuries in its sponsoring of client communities within Polish and Swedish empires. The goal was to try to destabilize those 
smaller empires, or actually, well, anyway. In more, in more directly anti-colonial situations, empires have courted the support of revolutionaries in a rival empire in order to seize that empire's territories and resources. So after arming revolutionaries who overthrow a state, that sponsoring state then proceeds to jail the revolutionaries and maintain the subordinate status of laborers and women, as did the US in the Philippines when it supported independence fighters' effort to oust the Spanish Empire. In their 18th and 19th century Atlantic world contests, the British and the French empires each fostered insurgency in the other's empires, including among Indian tribes and slave communities and American and Caribbean political radicals. We can easily think of recent instances of such a dynamic. On the other hand, as these examples hint, colonized and disenfranchised communities have in their turn manipulated these inter-imperial rivalries, courting and gaining support or weapons from one empire for their rebellions against another or their own empire. Such a strategy is, of course, very risky, yet it has sometimes worked. Thus did the Haitian revolutionaries court British support against France, and Irish revolutionaries gained support from the French for their anti-colonial battles against the British including a not much talked about 15,000 troop invasion by the French um, that failed due to bad weather. So, so much for, yes. And then there's weather. Um, so um, similarly in the 1940s, some leaders of India's independence movements extracted concessions from the British under the shadow of Japanese imperial ambitions and the shadow of alliances with the Japanese um, among the Indian political exiles and POWs in Japan who had been fighting for Britain and then found themselves in Japan, who, who built alliances with the Japanese against the British and some of whom formed the Indian National Army. So empires cultivating alliances with dissident communities, disenfranchised communities in their turn manipulating those inter-imperial rivalries and when challenged in this way, empires, in their turn, have had to adjust and react. They have sometimes retooled their laws and intensified their surveillance and punishments, enlarging police forces and instituting new border restrictions and penal codes. Historians have traced these clampdown effects, for instance, as they rippled across the Atlantic world following the Haitian Revolution, especially because that revolution had removed the most profitable, profitable island in the Caribbean from European control and created psychic and material conditions for other rebel rebellions. Again here, print media played an important role since, for example, the insurrections of Irish revolutionaries and African American communities were inspired by newspaper reports about Haiti, and again, the evidence is there. Likewise, in the 20th century, as Alika Bomer and others have documented, post-colonial revolutions were enabled by the trans-peripheral circulation of newspapers and journals inspiring new solidarities and maneuvers, even as they also provoked repression by the colonial authorities. Recent research has confirmed that trade, labor, migration, and marriage laws of colonizing states have been continually adjusted in the face of this potential for insurgence. Yet these intensified laws in the face of rebellion indicate that imperial rulers are not the sole engines of history. As Marx spelled out in searingly clear terms, history is fundamentally shaped by these dialectically unfolding power struggles. With the new data of critical world studies and within an analysis of inter-imperial dialectics, we can revisit contemporary scapes of power from this angle. We can note that co-forming contestations and co-productions are characteristic of the dialectic that is, interpenetrating relations among states, actors, and systems, have created shifting solidarities and antagonisms that unsettle system, systemic equilibrium while also tightening systemic connections. I'm proposing these dynamics are inherently part of the material dialectical processes that we call globalization. So to conclude, the historical narratives we tell about the world guide our actions in it, as Shahrazad's practice suggests. Just as she seeks to reframe the stories linking the long imperial past to the present and future, 
so we might seek to reframe our stories about the global world, including our scholarly and classroom narratives of how we got to our troubled present. Certainly, the history reveals that nearly at this point, wherever we live, our inter-imperial condition runs deeper than we have typically thought. Structuring everyday material and social relations, as well as macro-political engagements. In his book, Asia as Method, Huang Sing Chen argues that imperial histories of all kinds are deeply entrenched in our identities and desires. And in turn, he suggests that the reflective processes required for what he calls de-imperialization are more demanding than we've yet imagined. Indeed, we might go so far as to amend Frederick Jameson's concept of a political unconscious and consider the subterranean force of an inter-imperial political unconscious structured by long durée accretions, resentments, and desires. Embedded in a track-laying material environment, an inter-imperial collective unconscious may direct us as we fight wars, misread others, and may stall us as we pursue cooperation, diplomacy, and survival. We needn't look far in contemporary world politics among Russia, the Middle East, the US, Europe, China, and Africa to see that deep contests over the fuel lines of imperial infrastructure persist and are fed on all sides by old interpenetrating imperial imaginations. I have one more paragraph I want to pause and uh, somewhat sheepishly um, make just mention, because I, I care about it. It's like the venture you're trying to do here, the World Studies um, Interdisciplinary Project at UMass that I co-direct with my colleague in economics, Mwangi Wakitindi. Um, and what, but I'm also showing this slide, which is from our website, a little reconfigured, um, because of that image of the two faces in the upper right-hand corner. Um, we chose those images in designing the website, partly for the way, especially that profile on the right by Juan Gri, captures that sense of a sort of landscape reaching back that is actually embedded, in a sense, in the, in the psyche of that now sort of, I don't know what you would want to call that, um, modernized head. Um, the other is grieving. <laughs> so we'll just leave it at that. Um, but uh, I, th those images capture for me the way that it's important to be thinking about um, psyches as well as political economies and institutions and all the rest um, because they're, to my mind, embedded in us. Um, we carry them. We interact through them. So to conclude. This history of inter-imperial dialectics, however, also may reveal that de-imperializing processes have been underway for generations. The very existence of rebellion indicates as much, from the 9th century Zanj slave revolt in the Abbasid Empire to the 19th century Sepoy rebellion against the British to the post-colonial revolutions of the 20th century. Perhaps this long history has also created an anti-imperial groove in our thinking, call it an infrastructure of critical imagination. Its dialectical le legacy is evident in the very academies we occupy. These institutions are still inter-imperially entangled, but many of us are also anti-imperially oriented, and we influentially disseminate critical thought in print and in thousands of classrooms. States still constrain many of these institutions, and battles over them remain pitched as evident in the US in the defunding of universities and of tenured research faculties, the kind of research faculties without which a talk like this and the other talks today would not, would not be possible because there wouldn't be time for the research. Yet meanwhile, to close, if we integrate these new historiographies and reframe our work in this longer durée context, we may achieve some further dismantling of our historically entangled 
deeply shared in some ways colonial imperial habits. That is, we might more pointedly retool the material and ideological forces of our long dialectical past. Thank you. Thank you.